So, some final thoughts on uh, physical media. We will not talk about here about unguided medium. This is, I uh, will talk about this in the course mobile communications. But here are some more words about the last mile or the first mile, because there you see different media. So it depends on your point of view, if this is the last or the first mile. So for the customer, it's the first mile. For some network operator, it's the last mile. And there's the question now, how do we then finally connect your apartment to the internet without being too costly? So we try to avoid uh, having new cables. Yes, sometimes this is necessary. This is what you see all over the world. We place new fiber everywhere. But if possible, we try to reuse existing cables. And there are some popular solutions like digital subscriber lines, like reusing cable TV or like using deployed cellular networks, 4G, 5G networks. We'll not discuss cellular networks here, mobile communications. And then there are also some other solutions we will not discuss like power lines or using the power grid for data communication, satellite, microwaves and fiber to the home because fiber to the home is basically the fiber optics I just explained to your desk, to your home, to the curb, etc. So how did it all start? Remember, not replacing all the cables. And this is really a look into history, acoustic couplers. So I explained to you that we want to transmit digital data over the classical phone lines. And this is why we have to modulate them, our digital data, using the spectrum between 300 and 3400 hertz. So we create analog signals the classical telephone network can transmit. So, and that was the idea there. So the receiver transforms the analog signals into digital uh, data back and the telephone network just thinks, oh, this is a normal phone. Sounds a bit strange, but okay. It still stays within this 300 to 3400 hertz. And there we had data rates up to something like 56 kilobit per second, but many, many, many problems. So that's history you see in some of the 80s movies. What is quite common today, uh, if you do not have fiber, then quite common is DSL, digital subscriber line. So subscriber line is the copper wire you have on your classical of uh, telephone operator and this already offers up to 200 megabit per second using the existing infrastructure which is quite a lot this depends on the distance between you your dsl modem and a gray box on the street it's called the dslam and so the distance between you and there and from there it continues with fiber optics this determines the max speed so initially this was placed on top of the classical phone network. So there are carrier frequencies and this is the classical classical phone system limited. And then it was uh, said, okay, maybe we can use the, our installation with higher frequencies going up to many kilohertz. Why not going close to some megahertz, whatever. So we extend the range and try our best because now we have new technology. Today, this is all voice over IP. We don't have analog ISDN anymore, etc. Uh, but still, if you do this, if you use uh, this DSL, we reuse the old infrastructure. There are different versions, but mainly what we do is reusing the cabling and trying to use different tones, as it's called. Different tones, that means different frequencies on this copper wire. We modulate on different frequencies, how I will show you. And then depending on the distance, you can achieve certain data rates. These are just examples for downstream and for upstream. So how does it work? How does it look like? You at home, you have your twisted pair. That's the old cable for your old analog telephone or ISDN telephone. And the DSL modem, your DSL router, it's quite often called your DSL modem. Here we are on layer one does the modulation. And you have on the other side your, it's called a DSLAM, your DSL access multiplexer. And uh, on the road, gray boxes, you have your modem at home. And you don't want to replace the cable in between because that requires some installation and sometimes that's quite expensive. 
So what is done here is you create a certain spectrum consisting, for example, out of 288 channels. You spread them from 40 kilohertz to 1 megahertz. Just an example, leaving the classical telephone alone. So, okay, that's in the lower spectrum. And we have certain channels for upstream and certain channels for downstream. That's the idea. So VDSL2, the current uh, standard published in 2006, offers, for example, 200 megabit downstream uh, and uses up to 30 megahertz of bandwidth. Well, that's all up to the quality of the cable, the length, etc. And the main problem with all the DSL technology is this uh, interdependence with the distance between your router and the box on the street. So that's just an example. Uh, CAT3 UDP, that's your classical old twisted pair phone cable um, offering very low bandwidth. And there you can try to squeeze out as much as possible, for example, uh, something like 20 whatever megabit per second if there's a kilometer between you and the D-SLAM. And if you're on a countryside, you see data rates go down. This is why we need fiber in the countryside and everywhere. But DSL, that's uh, quite common uh, because uh, you can have quite high data rates if you're close to a DSLAM. And how is this done? We use many carriers shown here in the diagram. We have here our frequency, one megahertz, as I said, can go up to 30 megahertz. We need many, uh, we use many carriers, also called channels, of a certain bandwidth here. And those channels, they can overlap. That's not the point. The center frequencies are different. Certain number for upstream and certain number for downstream, typically way more for downstream because if you surf on the internet, we don't need the data rate in the upstream, only in the downstream. And then we modulate our digital data using, for example, QPSK, 64, QAM, or even higher on each of this channel, depending on the noise. So it could be the case that we use for a certain frequency 64 QAM, but for another one only QPSK because there's more noise. So easy case, yeah, use the same method on each carrier, but we can do this individually. So depending on the frequency, uh, sometimes higher frequencies, they have more errors than uh, lower frequencies. Because remember, this all runs over a CAT3 cable made for classical telephones. They were never made for several megahertz. So hmm, made for some kilohertz, that's it, but not for several megahertz. So we try our best and then we try to squeeze in as many bits as possible depending on the modulation scheme. Initially, there was only to one megahertz and higher frequencies. Oh, we could not handle this on uh, in the modem. So now we have very fast chips. How does it look like today? This is a current spectrum of a uh, VDSL modem. And this shows you here on the upper part, this shows you the carrier. These are those channels. And in yellow downstream, you see several parts of the spectrum for downstream. And here in this pink, violet, the upstream. So there are many, several uh, parts of spectrum for upstream. So, and you see also on the y-axis, the signal to noise ratio. So this is how much interference do we have? And you see stronger signals where the signal to noise ratio is higher, stronger, higher signal to noise ratio. And weaker ones for those higher numbers of the carriers because they use also higher frequencies. And then we have some other problems, which could be the neighbors. Because remember crosstalk, if your neighbors also use the internet with these telephone lines, typically all these classical old wires, they are bundled together and no one thought of DSL, etc. You're bundling and you have a lot of crosstalk interference. So DSL also suffers from the usage behavior of the neighbors. On the lower half, 
you see now the coding. On the y-axis, you see how many bits we use. Uh, in this example, we use here, for example, 10 bits per symbol. So 10, and you also see the carrier frequency here, uh, 13 something megahertz. Remember, cut three cables. So, and if we have problems, uh, then we have to go for lower uh, number of bits. But here you see, oh, less noise, better signal to noise ratio. We can go up to something like 15 bits per symbol. So different modulation schemes. So DSL can adapt the modulation for each individual carrier to the current situation. And you see the sending direction, we separate the direction in frequency. This, by the way, is called a frequency division duplex. So we have a full duplex system, but we separate the direction in frequency. We also see systems for time division duplex, but frequency division duplex is also quite common. So there are several standards for this. The classical one from 2004, 52 down, 16 megabit upstream, use up to 12 megahertz. And the newer one, that's a quite common one, VDSL2, offering this 200 megabit down and also upstream depending on the quality. And so this depends not only on the scheme, <laughs> how much you pay, but really on the interference on the distance. So that's quite okay, but that's more or less the limits today for copper wires. And this is why you see all over the place replacing this by fiber. There's always a trade-off. The longer the twisted pair, the lower the data rate. And this is why we have all these developments, FTDX, so that means fiber to the home, fiber to the building, this is what many people have, fiber to premises, fiber to the curb, etc., etc. So to the desk, um, that's nice. But the most common scenario today is that you have fiber to the home. And from there, you continue with twisted pair copper wires. So that's a common setting. Then we also have cable TV. Cable TV is there since many, many, many uh, years using coax cables. So we can use cable modems also trans to transmit our data, but now the infrastructure looks a bit different. So typically we also have fiber to a certain node, optical nodes, and then we serve several hundred, maybe 1,000, 2,000 homes from here. And then we have a tree-like structure with amplifiers. So they simply amplify the signals and this is where you can use coax cable. The problem here is you see we do not have an individual line from all the houses. Like we have a DSL where we have the DSLAM, we have individual lines. Here we share, we share this cable. And this also gives you a hint to the behavior under heavy load. Yes, there's also some interference between DSL cables, but here in the setting of cable modems, if all the neighbors also use the cable infrastructure, your data rate will definitely go down because it's a shared medium. So there are several standards. Again, you don't have to know the standards just to give you some hints where to look at. There it's called DOCSIS Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification, DOCSIS, and uh, also ITU2 recommendation initially made by Cable Labs and uh, uh, most operators follow DOCSIS 3. Now the newer standard is DOCSIS 4 and you see DOCSIS 3 around 10 years allows up to 10 gigabit down, 1 to 2 gigabit up using certain uh, modulation. DOCSIS 4 even allows a bit more in the upstream so it's almost not really uh, symmetrical. And then there are also some uh, combinations. But be aware, you share the capacities. This does not mean you will and all your neighbors will all the time get full 10 gigabit per second. Imagine a uh, cable operator uh, serves 1000 homes uh, from this optical node, 1000 times 10 gigabit. Um, nope, that's not possible. So, uh, 
also for DSL users, you cannot, uh, if every user uses the full speed, well, <laughs> the core network has some problems. Okay, so that's all about uh, media and who specifies also a lot of media and also specifies some higher layers. And this is the connection to also the next chapter, IEEE. IEEE will meet many of these standards, um, 430,000 uh, members, and they standardize everything that starts with this 802 dot whatever. You can look this up. For example, protocols, not only layer one, but also layer two. This is uh, layer one and two. You see many standards here shown in red, not you, well, not further developed. They are there, but no one uh, thinks that we have to do anything there. Ethernet, we'll have a closer look here. Token bus, token ring, that, and many other things, that, 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 whatever. Oh, wireless LAN. This is covered in mobile communications, 802.11ax, the current Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6e standard, and newer ones, Wi-Fi 7, etc. Then there are more, and oops, there's no 13. Okay, I thought these are engineers, but okay, uh, cable modems, but uh, so now this is done at uh, Doxies. You know, Bluetooth, Zigbee, wireless personal area networks, quite famous. And then some shown in this uh, yellow orange, they're just hibernating groups, so they are not disbanded. But they, maybe they are reactivated, maybe not. And then there are some more of these standards. So this basically shows you, okay, there's a lot going on, a lot, uh, many study groups. And uh, so IEEE, they cover a lot when it comes to local area network, wireless, wired. So this is where they are, personal air network, local air network, layer one, the physical layer, and layer two, main topic of the next chapter. Okay, to summarize, the physical layer is the basis of all networks. So what do we do? We send bit stream over service access point, so from the higher layers, the bit stream into the physical layer, the physical layer does everything to create a signal that matches the characteristics of the medium, that tries to be robust, efficient, self-synchronizing, contains the clock. We haven't looked that much at the interface here between the physical layer and the medium. This is where you have different types of plugs, like here for fiber optics or like here for classical Ethernet. We had a bit closer look to different media, the cables. So physical layer is the basis and here we have all these bandwidth symbol rates, data rates. We looked at the fundamental limits, so Nyquist, sampling, Shannon, the capacity. We looked at how we represent our data on the channel, so different data encodings, non-return to zero, all the pros and the cons, different modulation techniques, ASK, QAM, and we looked at the multiplexing like TDM, FDM, plus we had a look at physical media, fiber, twisted pair, and for mobile communications, yeah, we have left the wireless stuff and a bit of the satellite things. So finally, some uh, questions. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of different first and last mile technologies? Yes, you can look up at the, the vendors of the modems and they will always claim that this is better than this. But if you look at the fundamental architecture, you will find some differences. So what is the best solution from a technological point of view for our last mile? No. What are the differences between cable and cellular and DSL? We can also use cellular for our last or first mile. And then looking at the physical layer overall, so how does the physical layer react if there's a transmission error, if there's interference, if there's a flip bit? 